as Lizzie said, my name is Natalie Fisher. I'm the manager of student services here at the MSA, um, and I'm happy to present Bill. He is our lawyer that's going to facilitate this workshop today. Uh, Bill is a lawyer in good standing with the Law Society of Ontario, and he helps students here at Mohawk that um, need help with housing, family law, um, employment, immigration, OSAP, um, government matters, anything um, legal, he's happy to assist with. Um, and Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Natalie. We can go on to the next slide. Yes. And we are talking about uh, applying for post-graduation work permits and eventually a permanent residency. So the first point I'll make is that the most common class of application uh, for permanent residency by international students is the Canadian experience class. Now, some students may qualify under the skilled trade class or the skilled worker class or the Ontario immigrant nominee program. Uh, some may also qualify to be sponsored by a spouse or a common law partner or as a protected person. So I mentioned all of those possibilities as well. We are speaking primarily today about applying independently and for most international students, as I said, that will be under the Canadian experience class. And we can move on. To the next slide. Yes. That is, I think this is the next slide, Bill. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. All right. So to qualify, yes, uh, under the Canadian experience class, which as I said, most international students uh, will seek to do. Uh, most of them will require a post-graduation work permit. And the post-graduation work permit may be issued upon completion of a program of, of at least eight months. Now, most post-secondary programs are at least eight months, but the government uh, specifies that. So a program of at least eight months uh, and the post-graduation work permit will be for the same duration as the program unless the program was at least two years. If it was at least two full years, the permit may be issued for a period of up to a maximum of three years. A permit may be granted for the combined period of two different programs. So a student may take one program and move on to another and then apply for and perhaps be granted a post-graduation work permit representing the combined period of both programs. Uh, and again to the maximum of, of three years that requires that the programs be reasonably connected in some way so it seems like a continuous period of study of related study in any event any post-graduation work permit may only be for the uh, duration of the applicant's passport from their home country and uh, the government of Canada will not issue a post-graduation work permit longer than the expiry of the student's passport. But if a student is entitled to a post-graduation work permit longer than that, they'll get the shorter one. Once they renew their passport, there is a way to apply to the government of Canada to extend the post-graduation work permit to the full length it could have been initially. That really is the only situation in which a post-graduation work permit may be extended. So because of the pandemic and the shutdowns between 2020 and 2022 especially, special rules were put in place to allow a greater amount of time spent online to be counted toward the length of an academic program. However, as of September 1st of this year, the new rule is that at least 50% of a program must be in class and in Canada in order for that program to form the basis of an application for a post-graduation work permit. When the student successfully completes an academic program, the school will issue a letter confirming that. And the student then has 180 days in which to apply for a post-graduation work permit. There is a specific application form, and the student must also submit uh, the school's letter that confirmed a, su a successful completion, or a transcript, diploma, or certificate that proves completion. Some documentation, usually that initial letter, 
but something issued by the school that confirms successful completion. And also for their copies of a valid study permit and a valid passport or whatever other travel document, usually the passport. Now, post-graduation work permits may be applied for either online or in hard copy, but the government encourages students to do so online. And we can move on. When a student completes the requirements of the academic program, the time between then and when the school issues the confirmation of successful completion is technically still part of the academic semester. And um, that meant that students may continue to work just as they were able to during the academic semester. Once the school issues the confirmation of successful completion, the academic semester is officially over and the student must cease to work, at least cease to work on the basis of being a currently enrolled full-time student. However, there are two options here. One is that a student may apply for the post-graduation work permit as long as they still have a current study permit and they become eligible to work once that application for the post-graduation work permit has been submitted. So a student could conceivably submit the application even the same day that they receive confirmation of successful completion. And uh, in that case, uh, there could potentially be no gap in employment because it is possible to prepare the application. As I said, there's the form, uh, the personal documents, the, uh, the study permit, the passport, and they're just waiting for the confirmation of successful completion. It's easy to add that and submit right away. I wanted to mention another possibility is if a student is applying to another program and receives confirmation, then of uh, acceptance and they apply to extend their study permit on that basis, then as long as an application for an extension of the study permit is submitted while their current study permit is, is uh, still in effect, they also may continue working in that situation. But as most students will be seeking to apply for the post-graduation work permit, that's why I mentioned that uh, primarily. And again, if the student chooses, they can have the application all ready to go. And if they're working in a job at which they're allowed to continue to work, submit it the same day and they're allowed to go on working. And we can move on. So all applicants for permanent residency must demonstrate proficiency in at least one of Canada's official languages. So in English or in French or both in accordance with the Canadian language benchmark established by the government of Canada. In addition, applicants in classes based on work experience must apply through the express entry program and must show proof of experience that qualifies under the national occupational classification. Now the, the NOC, as we often call it, uh, breaks down occupations by a number of factors and it lists occupations that qualify such that the uh, experience qualifies, but there are two different uh, options here. The one is, as I said, uh, international students may complete a program, apply for the post-graduation work permit and obtain at least a full year's work experience. Again, that experience must qualify under the National Occupational Classification and if it does, then they may apply to the Express Entry Program. I mentioned before about uh, the Skilled Worker Program, and that is if someone has experience in their home country. But again, that experience must qualify under the NOC in order for uh, that individual to apply. And sometimes students do have that past work experience, are able to apply based on that as a skilled worker without having to obtain the experience in Canada that uh, makes them eligible to apply under the Canadian Experience Program. But they do, uh, if it's based upon work experience, must be on one or the other. And either way, the work, the work experience must qualify under the NLC. And we can move forward. So again, the permanent residence class is based on work experience, has slightly different requirements, 
I mentioned the skilled trades program as well as the skilled worker program and the K-experience program. But in each category, it's possible to calculate a score and compare it to the current minimums that are being accepted. Uh, applicants who have the work experience then submit certain documents and create an express entry profile and wait and hope that the government will contact them and invite them to actually submit a full application. Uh, I had said before about um, the work experience qualifying. And up until earlier this year, the National Occupational Classification divided uh, the occupations by different means. Essentially, it was possible to determine that uh, a particular occupation qualified as management, technical, or professional. They've modified that system slightly, but it's still the National Occupational Classification. It is still based upon jobs being uh, jobs that require education, jobs that uh, require education or skills, and uh, that someone uh, who has worked at can show that they have experience that is marketable here in Canada. Uh, and this would be four applicants under the skilled worker class, must show proof of similar employment in another country. Applicants under the skilled trades category must show proof of at least one year's technical experience. Again, this uh, is all detailed in the National Occupational Classification, and I can help any, anyone to maneuver a slightly updated new system. Uh, Every province also has an immigrant nominee program and uh, is permitted by the government of Canada. And so an international student may also uh, be sponsored by a special common law partner, as I mentioned, or qualified as a protected person, uh, but also under an immigrant nominee program. And in any of those uh, situations, the application may be submitted alongside one of the applications previously mentioned. Because if someone is being sponsored, for example, by a spouse or a common law partner, that person may also qualify to apply independently based upon their work experience. And I would always recommend to anyone to apply both ways if they can, because there's no contradiction there. There's no contradiction between being an independent applicant with work experience and also a spouse or common law partner of a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. So uh, typically the independent applications based upon work experience are processed more quickly and the government is more easily satisfied that the proof exists than being sponsored by a spouse or common law partner. But uh, as I say, depending upon just what stage, sometimes someone may have been married for long enough that they can apply right away to be sponsored by a spouse, might still have to wait a bit to gain the experience that enables them to apply independently. So by all means apply both ways, there's no contradiction. Uh, at some point when permanent residency is achieved by one way or the other, uh, it's still good to have the other. It's it's uh, still good to be in the relationship or to have the gain experience, even if you don't then depend upon that to get permanent residency. And we can move on. Yes. So, um, yes. So other categories. Uh, yes, as we mentioned, I think we had a glitch on the headings there, but we've we've covered all the material. So, yeah. We can see if there are any general questions. I think uh, we, we, we want to mention my email contact information. I think it's on the next slide. Yes. Yeah, um, 